Hi everybody, I'm Dave Kaufman. In this season two premiere of Herpers TV, we're gonna go back to Sydney, Australia to see one of the most incredible reptile collections I've seen anywhere in the world. Andrew Camo, who lives just outside of Sydney, Australia, takes reptile keeping to an entirely new level. And you're about to see why in this premiere episode of season two of Herpers TV, sponsored by Zilla. I'm a Herper, Herper, Herper. I'm a Herper, I'm a Herper. I have hundreds of animals here. It changes all the time. In breeding season, I might have up to a thousand animals because I've got so many eggs in the incubator, I could have 500 babies. Adult stuff, up to three or 400 at a time. Um, I'm always upgrading, making the cages bigger, more attractive to them so they feel like they're home. So it's always changing. I have a bit of everything. I have some snakes, some lizards, some monitors, turtles, frogs, spiders. A bit of everything. They're all so fascinating in all the different ways. So I don't really specialise in one, I specialise in all of them. Okay, welcome to my house. Okay, I'll take you into my lounge room first. This is one of my favourite rooms. Okay, this is my lounge room. I got me fish. Oh, I started with fish. When I first got into anything, fish were first. Like most reptile people, they start with fish or birds. Uh, I was watching Kelly, as we know, there's not much on TV these days, so I thought, why not make a coffee table with a rainforest under it? So I decided to make a rainforest coffee table. So I can just sit back on my lounge, watch the telly, the animals come running up, they come right in front of me. This cage is fully automatic. I've never ever cleaned it once. I've got uh, its own little uh, ego system going. I've got nails, sliders, worms, everything. So, if someone does a poo at night, all the worms and sliders and all the little bugs come and eat it. So it's totally self-cleaning. Had to do a few modifications. There's a, a fake fig tree here. So what I've done with the fig tree, there used to be a pile, that's where the piling is. So, so we didn't have to have an ugly piling piling in there. I, I made it look like a, like a, um, a fig tree. We're going to the next room. I thought to myself, why have a boring dining room table? Why can't I do something different? So what I come up with, I thought, Two holes in the top of the coffee uh, dining room table. I made enclosures, thermostats, heat lights, fully enclosed so we get no smell. And I put geckos in there. Lovely Amy eye in there. They're an awesome looking lizard. We'll see if we can find one for you. How I ac access it, I just open that lid like that. And we'll see if we can find one of the little critters. Here's one here. They're excellent looking gecko as you can see. And they live in my dining room table. Okay. Now I wanted some, something else in here, it wasn't enough, so I decided to knock a hole to the back of the wall and get a nice deep looking enclosure and I bought two lovely little snake enclosures in here. Same thing, fully automatic and they just open like that and that's their little homes. I rotate the animals of course, I don't leave the big snakes in here all the time, I just put different things in here depending on the mood. But it goes back to the next wall, so they're really deep. They're a lot deeper than, than they look. Okay, then I got one in a nice open space. So what this used to be here, there used to be a wall here. So I decided to knock the wall out. There used to be another wall sitting down here. I knocked this wall out, I put an extension on it and made a pool table room. I wanted something a little bit different. So what I've done, I've made dragons. Most people get a pool table room, they put a Jim Beam or a Coca-Cola over it, I thought I'd go the dragons, I love dragons so much. Here we got real life dragons. Okay, these are my Boyd's Forest dragons, these are the real life dragons. Awesome looking animal. And I love it in here, and again, this cage is fully automatic, I don't have to do anything to it. Self cleaning. The trick with the Boyd's Forest dragons, you've got to have a waterfall in there. Peat moss. I don't like the, the heaps of lighting, so you just cover the lighting up a bit. You use ceramic bulbs for your heat. Because in the rainforest, I live under the canopies usually, they're not that bright. So after we uh, worked out all the heat cups, they breed like this, not a problem at all in here. I put double sliding doors in this enclosure, so I'm getting to any, any sign I want to make it a lot easier. It's all that got custom made, but it had to be done. All the wiring's hidden and out of the bottom, so you can't see no wires. That looks nice and neat and tidy. Okay, that's my pool table room. I've been in the reptiles since about three or four years old. Um, 
When I was young, I got black and white photos of me holding blue tongues, uh, turtles, and my parents always encouraged it. They let me build my own little reptile pit. My old man put a little bathtub in the ground. I had turtles in there. And from that day on, I always loved reptiles. I liked watching dinosaur movies and anything to do with dinosaurs or lizards. I just couldn't get enough of it. And as I got older, I got a job and could afford to buy proper enclosures. Every, every time I bred something, the money I made, I got bigger and bigger and built bigger and bigger cages. So I've pretty much been doing it all my life and it's never gonna end until the day I die. Okay, this is all, I kept a lot of babies in here. Plus there's a makeshift classroom too. So um, what I usually do here, a lot of people buy an animal when it dies, they don't have to look after it. So what I've decided to do is have a reptile call. So um, people come here, I can fit 12 people in, sitting around a table. We talk about reptiles, how to look after him, like I'll grab some sand, say look, this is what you can use for, for your reptile. It's Sydney sand. It costs $5.50 for 20 kilos. It's perfect. Or you can go to the reptile shop and pay $55 for some red sand. So I teach people how to cut the cost down, the right products they can use. I'm not a shop. I'm not uh, shop orientated. So I get all about people is to save money to get into the hobby. A lot of people think it's expensive, but I can teach them all the tricks of the trade and they can save themselves a heap of money, not spend so much. All the different foods they can eat. Like, you can buy bearded dragon pellets for $30, or you can get greens for them for a couple of dollars. And it's the same thing, it's a lot fresher for them. Little things, tips like that I'll show them. How to powder coat, different bulbs you can use, what all the different thermostats do, how to make little incubators out of eskies, which work really well, how to do their uh, mixtures, how to make fly traps, the list goes on and on and on. I've got so many tips. How to catch insects. What this goes on, you turn it on at night, it sucks the insects out, you can pull them in. Even with the young kids, I get the kids come up here at night time, I say, put your light on, little bug catcher, vacuum cleaner, they can catch all the little animals. Kids have a ball with it. And I just teach them all stuff like that. And uh, yeah, it's been going quite well. Because I've read so many babies, I need somewhere to put everything, so this is just all baby holding stuff. Yeah. Same with here, baby black soils, baby blue tongues, baby black soils. Uh, there's a little baby Spencer's monitor. That's the ones I was telling you will grow really large. He won't be up here for much longer, because this is going to grow as big as me, this bloke. So yeah, he's going to get really big. I've even got a baby Panopti in here, which is another goanna. That's the one we will feed him. This bloke here grows massive too. That's a baby Panopti. Very nice goanna. Okay, they're on the endangered species list too because they're eating all the cane toads too. I keep these up here, they love the heat. This is a two-story house. This is where it gets really hot up here. When it gets too hot, I've got fans on every cage. Even in the walls, all the fans come on. All these cages here, I put all fans in. Same thing, it gets too hot, the fan comes on. Yeah, so that's the um, classroom. Keeping reptiles in Australia has been a total nightmare. National parks in Australia and the government don't want you to keep reptiles. So it's been a big fight, a massive fight. They're letting us keep reptiles at the moment. They're super, super strict. At the moment, I get checked once or twice a year. They come have a look. We've got to keep a lot of paperwork. If we breed something, we've got to write it down. Uh, yeah, it, 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 they're really strict. Um, we've got to put import-export licenses. So if I want to send something to, say, Queensland, I have to fill out a permit, uh, pay some money, they come check your animal out, and you've got to send it. You just can't send it to anyone. It's all written down, it's all documented. You can't crossbreed in Australia. You can just about do, uh, can't do anything. You can't have exotic animals here. It's got to be Australian native. If you've got a, 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 an exotic animal in Australia, like an iguana or um, a, a cobra, five years in jail, $100,000 fine. They are super strict. So, um, which is fair enough. We've had a lot of trouble with introduced animals in Australia. Name the cane toad. That's why they don't want any more uh, feral animals here, which is a good thing in a way. Okay, this is Sean and this is Aaron. They just bought a um, pygmy bearded dragon off me. So, young Sean and Aaron, they went and got a reptile license. So, they've, they've uh, applied online, probably, did you? We did. You did? And they I'm filled the it. I'm the one that I got it for my mum and Aaron. Did you? I mean, from my dad and my brother. 
Excellent. So that, that's a native thing. It's a bit of paper. He's done the right thing. He's got his license. Now, I'm selling him a pygmy bearded dragon. Because I've, I've bred this, I've got to do some paperwork now. So, I've got to find my reptile licensing book. Okay. I've got, I've got about five books, by the way, so it's a fair bit. I've got one with black soil dragon written on it. So, I've got to go through all my paperwork. I've got so many species here. Usually it takes a long time, but... I've got to find one with black soil dragon written on there. He bought one baby black soil dragon off me. So it says, what sex is it? It's too young to sex. So I, I put one unknown. He purchased it, so I put P for a purchase. Now I've got to write the bloke's name on there. So I'll get him to write his name on there. Yep. And he has an AKL number, which is an animal keeper's license. So. We look at his license here, and he's got an AKL number. That's an animal keeper's license. So I've got to document his number in my book. So it's 108156. That's to prove to me he's got a license. And if National Parks wants to look who I sold it to, they'll type that number in his uh, their computer. They know he come to me and bought a reptile uh, the reptile off me. He'll go home and do exactly the same thing. And that's what we've got to do in Australia. Every animal we breed, every animal we sell. Now, if I, if I breed an animal, I've got to look for my books and write a B. So on the 16th of the 12th, I bred 58 baby black soil dragons. I had to document that. So now I've got 88, you see? Then I sold four, then I've got 84. And it, it, it goes on and on and on like that. And that's how we do it. And here's your lizard. And there's your uh, license and back. Your license back for you. And there you go. Enjoy your animal. You said Andrew? You're quite welcome. Okay, there's a permit system in New South Wales. Every state's got a different rule. In New South Wales, there's class one, class two, and class three. Uh, class one's just for the beginners. You can have like a bearded dragon, a blue tongue, all the basic stuff. Then you've got a class two animal, which is like a harder animal to look after. It's the boys forest dragon, the big lace monitors, all the harder stuff. Then you've got the class three license, it's the venomous stuff, all the elapids. So, yeah, it's a lot harder to get the, the class three license. You've got to have a lot of experiences, do courses, get references from other breeders. So yeah, it's really, really regulated in Australia. This is my lizard pit. Um, I built this around 15 years ago. Um, there used to be a creek running through here, so I thought I'd put a bit of the creek back. So, as you can see, it come up pretty good. I just bought a massive pond, I put it on the, on the top, then I built the rockery going right down with it. I put all sewer pipes in there, so if there's any stray cats or anything, the animals have got somewhere to, uh, to hide. I find the water brings all the insects around, the moths around and, and flies, and all, all of the lizards catch their own food. I plant a lot of flowers all the time, which brings the bees in. You quite often see the lizards catching the food, the bees and that, off the flowers, which is really good. And a lot of these lizards are, um, eat the flowers themselves because they're so bright, which is really good to watch. Yeah, I've got a whole lot of species in here. They're all found in Sydney. Well, they used to be found in Sydney. We've had a lot of land clearing in Sydney now, so um, there's not much left anymore. So uh, they've got turtles, blue tongues, eastern bearded dragons, blotched blue tongues, a bit of everything. They all get along really well, really well together. Yeah. So that's my lizard pit. Okay, welcome to my reptile shed. In we go. It's been all decked out. I built it all myself pretty much. It, nearly every cage has been custom done. Every cage is fully automatic. They've all got two thermostats on. When it gets too hot, fans come on. Exhaust fans come on. Fully automatic, fully um, insulated. And I've made every cage look like a natural little environment. That's how I get a really good breeding ratio. Everything breeds here like rabbits. I have trouble keeping up with all the babies. They go so good. The trick I've found, if you can copy their environment, they go really well. I built this enclosure here about two years ago. Um, I've got a bit of everything in here. In this cage here, I've got mountain dragons. They're found at the Blue Mountains. That's as full of they, as big as they get. They're only insect eaters. Great little. Um, personalities. A lot of the time I'll, I'll throw flies in there and I love catching flies. You see them jumping through the air catching the flies and they're flying over them. It's really good to watch. Um, I've made it look where their habitat comes from, rock, branches, pretty much where they come from. So they, yeah, they love it in here. Over here I've got a colony of uh, central netted dragons. There's mainly central netted dragons in here. They're found in central Australia. They're a colony lizard so they love lizard, uh, living together. 
Uh, there's a couple of black soil dragons in here. Here's my new uh, white strain. It's a pygmy bearded dragon or a Henry Lawson eye. I'm one of the first ones to breed the white strain out of them, so yeah. Okay, these are my frill necks. This one here's a big girl. She's a rainforest one. She's found some cans and they've got a big white beard. Frillies don't do that much. Their defense mechanism, they stay still and don't move, so yeah. They usually only frill when they're mating or they're um, scared of a predator, okay? In comparison, we've got a Northern Territory one. It's got the lot red on it. And you can see this one's the male. It's got the big glands at the front and the female hasn't. Come here. There you go, buddy. Oh, and I forgot to put their waterfall on. I've got to chuck their waterfall on because I was cleaning it yesterday. Which is that button. And this is one of my most favourite lizard, it's a Spencer's Monitor. Um, this cage is only about six months old. I added a bit of character to this cage. For air vents, I, we cut out a gecko. Just add that little bit more character to the cage. Right, we grab the Spencer's Monitor. These monitors here grow about as big as me. They grow massive, okay? Uh, they're the bull terrier of the reptile uh, world in Australia. They get big and stocky like a bull terrier. They never bite, they hiss and they whip their tail. You can just about sit on and ride them. Yeah, that's the Spencer's monitor. He's only about three months old. It's only a little baby one. This is my lace monitor cage. Um, what I've done, they cut down in power and it's, it's that. I've got a hole in the roof. They go outside and get natural sunlight. And they go back down after they're warmed up. First thing in the morning, they always go up, get their sun and they walk around this cage all day looking for their food and doing what they do. I just threw some eggs down in this enclosure down here. It's, you could, um, they just pick them up, eat them whole. In the wild, they began to bird's nest and stuff, nicking the eggs out of the bird's nest. But I love the eggs. The problem, I have a problem is if one lays the eggs in my enclosure, the other one's coming eat the eggs. I've got to really keep an eye out when they're laying eggs. I've got about 15 eggs in the incubator at the moment. I take about nine months to hatch, but so I've got, I've got to be there to watch them. Otherwise, I miss the eggs all the time. There's about eight of them in here, they all get along fine. It's a nice big enclosure, walking enclosure, they've got plenty of room. Okay, these are water pythons. Um, the, the Australian Aborigines call them the rainbow serpents because as soon as you get them out in the sun, they get beautiful rainbow colours in them. But they're really, really snappy. They're not the most friendly, friendly snake in the world. Okay, these eat, love eating their greens. These are the pygmy bearded dragons. They always think it's going to be crickets first and they realise they're not getting crickets, they'll start eating the greens. So if they prefer to eat crickets first, they would. It takes me about two hours to clean and feed every day. I've got so many animals here now. Then I've got to go to work after that for another eight hours at work. I'm actually a train driver. <laughs> it's just a bit of a, um, a passion actually. So yeah, it, it never ends. As soon as I finish, I start again. So yeah, it's never ever going to end. But it's taken 20 years to build up and work out as I'm going. I've learned a lot of stuff on the way as I was going, things I've done wrong and I have to adjust it. A lot of trouble with the heat, because Sydney gets really hot, we can get up to 35, 40 degrees. That's why I had to put the fans in all the cages. It can be 40 degrees in your enclosure. If you've got a fan going, your animal's not a problem or it'll live. But if you've got no fan in your cage, you've got that wind draft coming through, they die. So yeah, it took a lot of time and effort to work out how to do it properly, but now I've got it down to 100%. So yeah, it's really good. What's your opinion? Do you think other countries should have a permit system to keep reptiles like Australia does? Comment below and share your opinion. Wow, wouldn't we all love a collection like that? You know, part of keeping reptiles and amphibians in captivity isn't just about keeping them in racks and breeding them and admiring the individual animal. It's about creating the art of mimicking their natural environment in captivity so that we can better understand and appreciate these absolutely amazing animals. Further on in season two of Herpers TV, we're gonna go back out into the world and we're gonna share many more exotic herping adventures, interview many more breeders, and we'll even have video care sheets. So tune in, subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Zilla Presents Herpers TV.